So the most frequently asked question of me since returning from my trip to Israel has been, so what was the highlight? Like, like what was your favorite memory? What was the best site? What are you going to remember, you know, 10 years from now? And my answer is, like, all of it, everything. Like, it's impossible to try to choose one thing out of an amazing trip, like a trip to the Holy Land. Uh, but if you pressed me, if you pressed me and you made me pick one site or one memory or or one experience, I might choose the experience that our group had on the site of the passage we're going to read together this morning. You see, on our first day in Jerusalem, we were able to get on the Temple Mount, where the temple once stood in Jesus' day. The Golden Dome of the Rock is now in the place of where the temple was. Uh, The picture with the Dome of the Rock is where our group of 25, we literally stood in this courtyard, in the outer courtyard of the temple complex. That courtyard in Jesus' day was called the Court of the Gentiles, where non-Jewish worshipers of God could pray and be taught the scriptures and worship God. I've included the other picture. It's a picture of the temple and this outer court, this entire large outer court, which that's what it looked like in Jesus' time. Now, our group stood in this courtyard, we read the passage we're going to read in just a few moments, and we prayed and worshiped together, and we're in awe on this site. It has become probably my favorite memory of the trip, and I think you'll understand why when we wrap up this morning. So we got to move quickly, real quickly this morning, so you need to focus with me for about 15 minutes or so as we step into the story. So turn with me in your Bibles or your device to Mark chapter 11, the Gospel of Mark chapter 11, and I'll set the stage, I'll fill you in on the action as you're turning there. Because the first 11 verses of Mark chapter 11 narrate the account of Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem when he rode down on the back of a donkey from the Mount of Olives on that original Palm Sunday. The day Jesus announced himself as the long-awaited Messiah And the crowds responded by hailing him as the king. Hosanna is what they shouted as they laid palm branches down in front of him. So the next few verses tell us that Jesus is making his way back to Jerusalem the next day, traveling down from the town of Bethany that's on the ridge of the Mount of Olives. He had been staying with his friends Mary and Martha and the recently raised from the dead Lazarus. So Jesus heads back to Jerusalem. He's traveling the same route as he did the day before on Palm Sunday, except this time he walked. He was walking with his disciples, heading back to Jerusalem, rather than riding on the back of a donkey. That's where we pick up the action in verse 15 of Mark chapter 11. I'll read. On reaching Jerusalem, Jesus entered the temple courts, and he began driving out those who were buying and selling there. He overturned the tables of the money changers and the benches of those selling doves and would not allow anyone to carry merchandise through the temple courts. And as he taught them, Jesus said, is it not written, my house will be called a house of prayer for all nations, but you have made it a den of robbers. Let's stop for a minute and talk about the action taking place. This is one of those exciting, dramatic uh, passages that kinds kind of changes your picture of Jesus a little. Especially if you see him as this, you know, pasty, mellow, unexcitable wallflower. Uh, A mischaracterization to be sure, but one that's often propagated in movies or Sunday school classes. When Jesus entered the temple courts in our account, coming from the Mount of Olives on the east, he undoubtedly entered through the Eastern Gate, also known as the Golden Gate. The main gate that led directly into the outer temple court when you're coming from the east of Jerusalem, from the Mount of Olives. It's now closed off, but it was a very popular entry gate in Jesus' day. The arrow in this picture points to the now blocked in Golden Gate, which is in the outer wall when viewed from the Mount of Olives. Uh, After entering this gate, you are immediately entered into the large outer court of the temple. As I mentioned, it was known as the court of the Gentiles, this large outer court is where Gentiles were invited to be taught the scriptures. They could pray and they could worship. In fact, it's where Jesus did the majority of his teaching when he was in Jerusalem. Well, the text says that he enters this section of the temple courts and he began driving out the merchants who were selling animals for sacrifice and flipping over tables of those who were exchanging foreign currency for the temple shekel. The temple shekel was the only accepted money for temple offerings. 
So Jesus shuts them down and sends them out of the temple courts, teaching them that what they were doing was totally unacceptable and displeasing to God. Well, we've taught, you know what we've done in the past? We've taught that the unacceptable behavior Jesus condemned was that these merchants were ripping off people. They were taking advantage of Jewish pilgrims by overcharging them for the animals for the sacrifice or charging ridiculous exchange rates for the temple shekel. That, that's probably true. That probably was happening. But I'm convinced, I'm convinced it was not the focus of Jesus' rant. It was not all about the money. How do we know? I think we find it right there in the text. See, Jesus made his charge against these Jewish merchants by quoting two different Old Testament passages, one from the prophet Isaiah, one from the prophet Jeremiah. The quote from Isaiah says that God's house, the temple, will be called a house of prayer for all nations. Jesus then tacks on a quote from the prophet Jeremiah, condemning behavior that makes the temple function as a den of robbers. And here's what we intuitively do. We hear that term, den of robbers, and we make it all about the money. We conclude that Jesus is condemning the merchants for robbing these Jewish worshipers headed into the temple. Not so fast. Not so fast. I'm convinced that Jesus is not specifically condemning what these Jewish mer merchants were doing, like ripping people off. I'm not saying he's condoning it, but I think he's more concerned about where they are conducting business. Let me explain, because I think a careful reading of the text will uncover the primary reason that Jesus is flipping over tables. Let's look at the Jeremiah passage that Jesus quotes first. Jeremiah chapter seven. In this chapter, the prophet issues a very stern warning to Jews. They're acting selfishly and sinfully. See, they think they're covered. They think they're protected because they've got the temple. Like they can just go to the temple and offer prayers and God accepts them, they're right with God because they have the temple, the only acceptable place of worship. That's what's in their mind. Jeremiah seven reads like this, starting in verse one. This is the word of the Lord that came to Jeremiah from the Lord. Stand at the gate of the Lord's house, the temple, and there proclaim this message. Hear the, word of, hear the word of the Lord, all you people of Judah who come through these gates to worship the Lord. This is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel says, reform your ways and your actions, and I'll let you live in this place. Do not trust in deceptive words and say, this is the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, as if we've got the temple, we're all good, we're safe. It's like us saying, I go to that church, I attend that church, I belong to that church, so I'm all good. You know what God says? He says, do not trust in deceptive words like that. Verse five, God says, if you really change your ways and your actions and deal with each other justly, if you do not oppress the foreigner, the fatherless, or the widow, and do not shed innocent blood in this place, and if you do not follow other gods to your own harm, then I will let you live in this place, says the Lord, in the land I gave your ancestors forever and ever. But look, you are trusting in deceptive words that are worthless. Will you steal and murder, commit adultery and perjury, burn incense to Baal, and follow other gods you've not known? And then come and stand before me in this house which bears my name and say, we are safe? What, safe to do all these detestable things? Has this house, which bears my name, become a den of robbers to you? I am watching, declares the Lord. Den of robbers. I mean, what does that term mean? Den of robbers, have you, have you thought about it? What's another name, another term for a den of robbers? You know what the translation is? Hideout. The term den of robbers is translated hideout, a safe place for thieves and robbers to lay low once they've committed their evil deeds. You know what God is saying? He's saying, has this house which bears my name become a hideout for you where you can act detestably and then think it's okay, we're safe because we have the temple? Because I attend temple every week? I'm protected because I don't miss? God says it doesn't work like that. I've been watching, declares the Lord. You can't do evil and then claim sanctuary in the temple. He says, it doesn't work like it. You can't live one way out there 
and then pay lip service to me in here and think we're all good. We're safe because we're offering sacrifice in the temple. God says, do not trust those deceptive words. So Jesus referenced in Jeremiah 7, he condemns a wrong attitude that some Jews had that thinks that they're right with God and in good standing with God because they have the temple, because they worship in the only rightful place to worship. As if their worship was acceptable because it was offered in the temple. And God says this, he says, no, no. Right standing and acceptable worship is not found in a place. It's found in right behavior, right attitudes, right actions. So the passage in that Jesus quotes from Isaiah 56 is even more telling of why Jesus is so exercised over what is happening in this court of the Gentiles, the outer court of the temple. We'll read it. Isaiah 56, I'll read it from starting in verse 4. For this is what the Lord says. To all those formerly excluded from the temple, those who keep my Sabbaths, who choose what pleases me and hold fast to my covenant, to them I will give within my temple and its walls a memorial and a name better than sons and daughters. I will give them an everlasting name that will endure forever. And foreigners who bind themselves to the Lord, to minister to him, to love the name of the Lord and be his servants, all who keep the Sabbath without desecrating it and hold fast to my covenant, these I will bring to my holy mountain and give them joy in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and sacrifices will be accepted on my altar, for my house will be called a house of prayer for all nations. This is why Jesus was so amped up when he entered the temple courts and saw these merchants buying and selling. It's because they were desecrating the one place on the temple grounds where foreigners, where Gentiles, where outsiders could worship and pray and be taught the scriptures. See, they had set up shop, shop right in the middle of the Gentile place of worship. They were doing business and merchandising in the middle of their worship center, treating this sacred place for non-Jews as insignificant, as second rate. Why? Because it wasn't in the temple proper. That's why Jesus went off on them. These Jewish merchants had thought nothing of interfering and dis diminishing Gentile worship, even after God had declared it is acceptable and pleasing to him through the prophet Isaiah. Look at the original text in Mark chapter 11 again. It gets better. It says that Jesus not only overturned some tables and drove out some business people, but he also would not allow anyone to carry merchandise through the temple courts. See, it wasn't just the unscrupulous merchants who were desecrating the Gentile worship space. People were using the outer court of the Gentiles as a cut through, a shortcut from the Mount of Olives into the city. They were cutting through, entering the Eastern Gate, going through the outer co court, going right through the worship with all their stuff, with all their junk, instead of going around the temple complex so as not to bother the Gentile worship. They were using the temple courtyard as a through street. It showed total disregard for the value and sanctity of Gentile worship. That was the attitude that Jesus was confronting and condemning, condemning as he turned over tables and drove others out that day. This attitude towards inferior worship, because it's not done in the temple, it's not done by true Jews, was the attitude Jesus confronted. And it flew in the face of what God had just spoken through the prophet Isaiah that we just read. And these Jews should have known it. That's why Jesus went off. He reminded them that God's, what God had said in Isaiah 54, 56, my house is a house of prayer for all nations, God says. I'll give them a name that will endure forever, better than sons and daughters, foreigners, Gentiles, non-Jews, anyone who calls on my name and loves me, I will receive them and give them joy in my house, says God. God is saying, I will be theirs and they will be mine. That's what he said through the prophet Isaiah. And now he says it through his son, Jesus. Jesus says, my God is a God for all people. I no longer have a chosen people. I have chosen people from every nation, every tribe, every tongue to be my sons and daughters. I and my house are accessible to all as I want relationship with everyone, all peoples of the earth. You should be saying amen, people. Amen. If you're a non-Jew, this is good news, people. <laughs> this is your invite in, right? That's why my house will be called a house of prayer for all nations. This is great news for us. Man, if you weren't born Jewish, this is your invitation to be accepted in the family of God. 
When Jesus clears the temple courts, he is demonstrating just how much he values the worship of non-Jews like you and me. This is Jesus being absolutely clear about how he feels about you and me, that he loves us, he accepts us, and he wants nothing to hinder our access to God. He literally took matters into his own hands to make sure that no one or no thing could keep you from access to the Father. This is Jesus literally clearing the way so you and I have full access to God to pray, to worship, to love him, and to be loved by him. Most importantly, be loved by him. That's why 25 of us stood on this temple courtyard and we worshiped and we prayed and we said, this is too good to be true. That God, you have made a way for us. You've, granted, you've grafted us in. You have adopted us into your family and you have made us and called us sons and daughters. That's the good news. That's why we stood there. That's why we said, this is an amazing place. This is holy ground in this temple courtyard because this is where we got our invite in. We didn't have to be the chosen people, but we are the chosen ones because God chose us. How good is that? That is great news. We want to thank you for watching and listening to our sermons online, and we hope that uh, you will be inspired to live more like Jesus through these. Please check out blackrock.org for more information about our church. Know that you can subscribe to our podcast on iTunes, and also uh, know that you can give uh, to BlackRock and to our ministry through PushPay, through our mobile app, and on our website. Your uh, donations and your support of our ministry allows us to have uh, these videos online and for us to impact our community.